We often hear people say, be in the world, but not of the world. But honestly, like, what does that even really mean? And what does it mean on a daily basis? Uh, we want to be a people who are always headed toward Jesus, but we just have to acknowledge the whole world doesn't always cooperate with that, and we don't always cooperate with that. But we want to be that kind of people. We want to be the kind of people who are different and together, always headed in Jesus' direction. So we're in a series called Just Visiting, Different Together, where we explore that tension from every possible angle, sticking together the whole way. We hope you'll take the whole journey with us. Hope you'll download the teaching notes and follow along as we jump into 1 Peter on the weekends, into the book of James in our group time. It's going to be so good. Grab a friend to watch with you. Here we go. Uh, around here, we try to look into God's Word every single time we get together. So if you have a Bible, I just want to encourage you to find your way to the book of First Peter. Tell somebody First Peter. It's a short letter. We're going to read it together this week. Uh, I'm going to do some intro here, so throw the bookmark in it, set it aside for a minute. If you don't have a Bible, you can use the QR on the back of the seats. There's a a link to a free Bible app that's not from us, doesn't have ads, it's just to you, for you to, to help you out. Or, of course, you can find the notes and follow along. All the quotes and stuff that show up on the screen will be found there uh, where it says teaching notes. So jump into those if you want. But let me begin with a question. How do we live in a place that is not our home? This is a question we're gonna wrestle with for several weeks. How do we live in a place that's not our home. It's a question that my family and I had to wrestle with 12 years ago when we found our way from Illinois where we had lived inside basically a three hour circle our whole lives and found our way with four kids, five and under, to Las Vegas, Nevada of all places. Now it wasn't the first time I had been here. I visited once before. I was a math teacher in a former life and taught high school math and so, you know, lifeblood of our city, conferences, entertainment, gambling, hospitality, all those sorts of things and so there was a math teacher conference and it was as exciting as you can imagine that I came out here for as a young teacher, stayed at the Treasure Island a couple nights and the Venetian a couple nights and learned from others and taught others. And like a lot of people who find their way to our city, basically got in some kind of shuttle at the airport, made the way to the strip, that's really all we saw. I went back to the airport and flew out and I was like, well, did that. It would be a number of years later that a guy named Mitch would call up and say, hey, we're, we're looking for somebody to come help with our student ministry and somebody said you might be interested, give me a call back if you'd like to talk about it. So, uh, you know, I, I was on a trip with other students back in Illinois at the time and I was thinking, I don't, you know, I've been to Vegas, I did that, I, I visited, I saw it, I'm not sure I need to go back, it's, it was fine, but whatever, I can't really imagine that from my little perch in central Illinois, Vegas seemed like a long, long way off. So I've, I've told this story a number of times, but I went home and I told my wife, hey, I think I'm just gonna politely decline. Uh, and she says, uh, you know what, what's the harm in a phone call? And it's crazy how often the Holy Spirit sounds just like my wife. <laughs> uh, and so I call and sure enough, step by step by step, it would be uh, not long after that we agreed to come out here. And uh, so my dad and I actually came out on a visit, or we came out to try to determine whether we were gonna come, and so Lane and I came out here at the end of February, and we visited and got beyond the Strip and saw all these beautiful mountains. Saw a bunch of really honest people in a really beautiful city and a great place, and what God was up to in a really cool church, and thought, you know what? Maybe God has something in this. And so once we said yes to that, I came back one more time with my dad to try to find a place to live. It was 2012, bottom of the market, which is beautiful, except it's really hard to find one that's not gonna get outbid on, and so we're just trying to find a place to land. And let me just tell you, there's a Grand Canyon difference between visiting for a conference and figuring out if you're gonna live in a place. Because I don't know if there's a place in the United States that would have felt much farther from home than Las Vegas, having grown up in the cornfields of Illinois. You just think differently when you're planning to live somewhere that doesn't feel like home, you know? And so uh, it would be July of that year that we would load our four kids, five and under, in the minivan, and I don't know what possessed us to go slow, but we took six days to drive those 27 hours. <laughs> Whew. And so when we finally crested the hill out by Apex and Nellis and saw the city for the first time, we're like, well, this isn't home, but here we are. Didn't have a house yet, some generous people let us stay in their house, and listen, it can be really weird to roll into a place that is gonna become your home but isn't home yet. Can I get a yep from anybody who's moved? That can be challenging. Some of you guys are pros at it. UPCS, different places, you've been so many different places, you just got a system down. But listen, rolling into a new place that does not yet feel like home is challenging. 
living in a place where you're not sure your values are gonna align or the climate is gonna uh, come out. Like, everything in the desert tries to stab you. Do you. Can we just agree on that? Like, that's weird, okay? There are bugs in the mi Midwest that bite you, but things here try to stab you. Anyway, uh, it's a huge transition. How do you live in a place that's not your home? Now, before we go farther and explore this on a lot of levels, not just literally moving from one city to another, uh, it can be challenging to get used to a place. And so we just wanna be supportive uh, people of one another. It was so different to come here. There were all kinds of different things that needed to be required to live in Las Vegas that were not required to live in Illinois. And I just think there might be people here who just moved here and we wanna help you out. So we're gonna play along a, a little simple game. I hope you'll play along with us. I wanna invite everybody to stand up for just a minute. We're gonna find out how long people have lived in Las Vegas, okay? Go ahead and stand up. So call to mind the number of years, months, or days, maybe hours, that you've lived in Las Vegas, okay? If you're just visiting, that's cool. You can sit down on the first round here in a minute. Uh, you can also, just free permission, if you hate games or whatever is happening right now, just sit down on the first one too. We, we won't call you a liar or anything, doesn't matter. Okay, so listen, if you are native to Las Vegas, you've never lived a day, like you've always lived in this city, would you go ahead and sit down right now? Look at, the, look at those people. You need to ask those people where to get some food <laughs> and just let them tell you stories about how the spot we're in right now used to be the middle of the desert, okay? If you've lived here for uh, 25 years or longer, that's my standard for you're basically a native to Las Vegas. 25 years or longer, go ahead and sit, sit down. Look at you, look at you holding up our city. Give it up for the 25 plus crowd, all right? All right, we gotta move along, so uh, let's do this. If you've been here 10 years or longer, go ahead and sit down. That would be where I would have to sit. I've been 12, 10 years or longer, great. Five years or longer, welcome to our city. You've made it through several summers, right? Good job. If you've been here one full year or longer, go ahead and sit down. All right, look at these people who just survived their first summer. <laughs> okay, listen, uh, we're just trying to whittle it down to the people who got here most recently. So if you've been here one month or longer, go ahead and sit down. One month or longer, okay? We're, we're going all the way down. You, if at any point you don't wanna play anymore, feel free to sit down if you feel weird, okay? <laughs> but if you've been here one week or less, like, or sorry, if you've been here one week or longer, go ahead and sit down. Anybody here less than a week? We still got people who just arrived, all right? All right, we got some over here. We got some over here. All right, here it is. I'm just gonna start counting down. So six days or longer, sit down. Five days or longer, sit down. Keep your eye on them. Four days, I'm a terrible auctioneer. Three days, two days, one day. You got here to two days over here. I got two days and they got somebody still over here. One day, is there somebody there a one day? Oh my gosh. Welcome to Las Vegas. Welcome our friend to Las Vegas. Come on, we got somebody over here. One day, two days. What? One more time. You're visiting, we're so glad that you're hanging out. Thank you for visiting Las Vegas. It's people like you that help us not have state tax. We're so grateful. Hey, listen, uh, we wanna provide a gift, so our guest services are gonna help out land the, the people who've been here the least amount of time, and if we miss you for some reason, it's really hard to see in this room, we got a gift for you at Info Center, but we wanna make sure they're prepared, so we're giving them some, uh, some chapstick, some sunscreen, some shades, a water bottle, because hydrate or die, you know what I'm saying? A sunshade for the front of their car. These are the things that you need to survive in Las Vegas. It was so different than when I arrived in Illinois. I brought mosquito repellent, which actually turns out I need it again. I wish I hadn't gotten rid of it. Uh, and then uh, there's, I, we also just as a joke put in the gift bag one of these. Do you know what one of these is? Do you know what these are? Wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Maybe it's not plugged in. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Here's why we put, how many of you don't know what that is? Anyone like, I, I don't understand. Thank you for being honest. When we moved from Illinois, we had several of these and I tried to sell them in a garage sale at my house. <laughs> if you don't know, this is what these things are supposed to do. Uh, maybe if you go snowboarding on Charleston, you could use it, but uh, uh, listen, when you go from one place to another, you're not sure what to bring with you, you're not sure what to leave behind. When some place is brand new to you and it doesn't yet feel like home, how do you live in a place that's not your home? 
we live in this kind of tension as followers of Jesus. You know, we walked in or we rolled into Las Vegas and realized, you know what, we're not from here, but here we are. You know, like we just, it's like, how do, how do we live in this place? I, I know it really makes sense moving from one city to another, but there's a way in which when we take on an identity as a follower of Jesus, we find ourselves kind of foreign to our surroundings. As we point ourselves in the direction of Jesus, we just find ourselves often deviating from everything else that's around us at different times. Sometimes lining up and finding ourselves feeling like we're at home, but at other times, like, I just feel so out of place. When we moved here, we had to ask questions like, what do we need to hold on to, bring with us? What do we need to learn or adjust to live in a new place, in a new way? What kind of people will we become living in a place like this? My, my, my parents, who always lived in Illinois, had some real concerns about their kids moving to Las Vegas. You know, this is the tension. This is, this is not our home, but here we are. How do you live in that kind of tension? And this is not our home, but here we are. There's something, like I said, in this picture for all of us who follow Jesus. And I just wanna show you because uh, this guy named Peter, a friend and follower of Jesus, wrote a whole letter to people who were experiencing that very thing. How do we live in the direction of Jesus in a world that often does not cooperate, that often even works against that? How do we not just get frustrated and give in or belligerent and like go after, but instead hold on to in the midst of challenge and sometimes deep suffering, the direction that Jesus has called us, trusting that he is good in mind at every step. Peter wrote this letter to people who were experiencing some really hard times. Today I'm just gonna show you the beginning and the end, but we're gonna look step by step through the whole thing for the next seven weeks because Peter offers us one thing after another to help us walk differently in the direction of Jesus even when what's around us doesn't help with that. How do we discern and live really well in a time like that? How do we live in a place that's not our home? First Peter chapter one, verse one. I'm, I'm really only gonna cover like three verses all day today. First Peter chapter one, verse one is one of them. It says this. This is a letter from Peter, an apostle of Christ. And he says, I'm writing to God's chosen. Somebody say chosen. chosen. It's important because we gotta hold on to that, okay? God's chosen people who are living as, what does it say? foreigners. They were in a land that was not their own. Now, for them, that's partly literal. He goes on and he says, uh, in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and um, Bithynia. I almost messed up the one word that I actually know how to pronounce. Did you catch that? They were living in a land that wasn't their own, partly because they had been run out of, many of them had been run out of Jerusalem, where uh, there was, they were experiencing huge persecution in the first century, time after Jesus had been resurrected. They were experiencing all kinds of challenge. And so they were spread out everywhere to other regions that literally were not their home. But they were also living as people who living with very different values, values that were like surfacing from their relationship with Jesus and what he had accomplished, the very things Jesus had called them to, and the culture around them did not cooperate. Can anyone relate with that? This is our story, right? Consider the world around us. What are the values, if you just went along with what you experience in the world around us, where would that carry us? Some of us in various aspects of our life know exactly where that would carry us. Uh, we, we've lived a, a different seasons and, and found our way. As you think about it, don't just be cynical. There's actually great things about where we live as well. Let's be honest. Let's hold up the things that are not terribly helpful. Let's also celebrate the things that, that we get to enjoy at different times that actually do line up with what God has invited us to. But let me offer you a quick image. Uh, my friend Mitch talks about culture like this. Uh, in the Midwest, and maybe in other places too, most of the pools for people that I hung out with, if you had a pool, it was an above ground pool, right? It was like four foot steel walls with some kind of liner in it, and it was al almost always round. We had one of those, and one of our favorite things to do was to get uh, like four, five, six kids in there and all start running around that pool in the water as fast as we could in one direction because it made just an epic world pool if you got after it, you know what I mean? And then as soon as we thought we got it going as fast as we could get it going, everybody would lift up their feet and just let the current carry them along. That's, his, that's the way Mitch describes culture. In, in general, organizational culture, large scale culture, all the things. If you just did that in life the way that we are, just ran the direction everyone is running, then lifted your feet and let it carry you along, where would it take you? Just reflect. Because I wanna, and I would encourage you to spend some extended time 
thinking about that. Think about your work culture, your family culture, your neighborhood culture, your social media culture, all the things, that, the influences that we're inviting into our world. Where are they carrying us if we just went along? Nobody's that naive, but if we did, we would just, where would it take us? As followers of Jesus, we have kind of a different compass. And we've talked about this at length, so I'm gonna try to talk about it fairly quickly, but in one of the places in the scripture to look for the kind of people we're becoming is in Acts chapter two. People who were following Jesus together, there's this really cool portrait, a description of people and the values we uphold. And I just want you to notice how different these are from what you would imagine if you just went along with everything that's around you. Because as followers of Jesus, here's, here's what we acknowledge is that we, we try to put this in a picture that we call the healthy church football, which is right because it's football season. Who's stoked for football season? Anybody? Come on. Come on. The Raiders are playing today. Michigan lost yesterday. It's a great weekend, okay? <laughs> Listen, uh, what we believe to our core is that Jesus was not a great man, but he was God-made man, that he entered creation and having done no wrong on his own, offered his life for all the wrong every single one of us has done and ever will do and that he conquered death, resurrecting to a new kind of life. This is all in a simple picture. De like entering creation, dying on a cross, and resurrecting to an unending, like recreated kind of life. Not just one time, but as a picture of what God will do for every single person who trusts him. And because of that, he's king over everything. He's the king that we need. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is his title. He's the anointed one, the king, the one God promised who would turn everything right side up. And so we just always try to point our life in his direction. And so when we acknowledge that that's who he is, the one who nothing would have been created without him, he has good in mind for us and he's called us back to God, we do everything we can to turn our lives in his direction. The Bible calls that repentance. We turn away from anything that's not honoring to him and we turn toward the things that he says are best for us. Whether it's a one degree change from where we were or a 180 degree change from where we were, we're always turning in his direction. And we identify with him and acknowledge that our who we are is wrapped up in who he is, and we exemplify that in a practice called baptism, which by the way, there's a bunch of people getting baptized today. You should come celebrate with people. It's gonna be awesome. They're just saying, yes, Jesus is king. Yes, I trust him to call me alive like he resurrected and that I will always turn my life in his direction. That's what they're saying. They're getting baptized, and what Jesus promises in Acts 2, or what Peter promises is that the Holy Spirit, God himself, will live in each of us and all of us together. He will live in us and among us to give us all the strength we need to do all the good things that he's calling us to do. This could be called the gospel. What Jesus accomplished for us and our response to it and the promise he makes, this is, what, this is where we're going. How far have we deviated from the rest of the world so far? Don't forget where we're going with this. Who's king in the world? To, uh, I mean, that's what we think. But in the world, if you just go along with the culture, you're just running in the direction of the pool, it's, it's money, it's accomplishment, it's a certain candidate, it's a certain country, it's a certain whatever. There's all kinds of kings. And changing your mind in our culture, that's not actually allowed, right? That, the humility required to say, I may have gotten something wrong, there may be a better way, and I may not even be the person who knows it, there may be one who has always known it, and I can, that's, that's foreign to our world. To identify, there's all kinds of identity questions in our culture right now. To identify with Jesus and take on his identity, Crazy talk, I'm just saying, look how different it is. And remember our question, how do you live in a place that's not your home? We, we go on and we say, listen, our guidebook is not just everyone's best thinking, our guidebook is, is God's word, which is why we look into it all the time. It's why we wanna just turn, it's how we know which direction to turn. We do that together with other people in like committed fellowship. We do this by sharing in meals and particularly the Lord's Supper, the communion that we would like remember who we are and that we pray like crazy because we know that nothing happens without God's help and we wouldn't want it to happen without him. That's the whole point. We want to be with him. He has invited us to be with him. This is so different than the rest of our culture. And when we do these kind of things, we experience things that are just like, whoa, exclamation point, like God did something we could not have orchestrated on our own when we just trusted him to do what only he can do. And so because we trust him and because he's so good, we don't just like hoard our time and our money. We are generous with the time and money that God has given us. That's so different than the culture and the water that we swim in. And that we would adore and sing out to God like, God, you're the best and this is the best and God, keep going. 
that we enjoy the favor of God and men and that we hand what's been handed to us to others so that they could hand it to others. We make disciples who can make disciples. Just for a moment, reflect on how different this is than if you just went along with everything you experience. And we get a sense of why the question, how do I live in a place that's not my home, is really important. And it is the question that Peter was trying to help people answer. It is that question. In fact, you'll explore this a little bit in Acts chapter two if you jump into the study this week. So feel free to capture that or you can always, we train it at Discover Kenyon Ridge all the time. Peter was writing a letter to people who were experiencing that kind of dissonance. The way they lived and the values with which they lived, they had come alive in such a way they never wanted to give back, but they were like, or they never wanted to give away, but they were, experienced real hardship. In fact, it's, it's really weird. If you, if you read about the first Christians' experience in the first century, people actually called them atheists. Isn't that weird to think about, that Christians would be called atheists? But in the first century, there was, pantheism was such a big deal. There were so many gods that anyone who would say there's only one must not be, they must not believe in God. They don't understand God. They're atheists. Uh, first century Christians that Peter would have written to were also considered to be cannibals. That's weird, right? Didn't see that coming. But they were people who believed that when Jesus said, this is my body and this is my blood, they misunderstood that when they would celebrate their savior in communion, they, they're like, that's really weird. Those people are weird. They thought that believers were incestuous because they said they loved their brother and sister. And so because of all of this, they were an easy target and a really pretty awful ruler named Nero uh, would take some of these Christians, not a lot, but some, and uh, use them as candles for his garden parties. Or entertainment as adversaries for wild animals as everyone watched. So when Peter wrote a letter and said, you are living as foreigners, you are living differently than the culture around you, it had meaning. It was a visceral experience. And so in a very intellectual culture in which we live, the kind of differences, distinctions, and persecutions or suffering that we might experience are, are quite different than those things, no less important, and no less likely to drive us off course or carry us along in culture. And so we need to ask the question, how how do we live in Jesus' direction in an uncooperative culture? Peter would go on and he says, listen, here's why I'm writing it. Here's why I'm writing it. And I I don't want you to miss this. And so if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. This is the very end of this short letter. You only have to turn like one page, maybe two. This is why you're going to read what letter this week? What are you reading this week? 1 Peter. It's not going to take you long. 1 Peter chapter 5, you'll see one statement after another to help people live in a place that's not their home. He says this in in verse 12. He says, I've written to you and sent you this short letter to encourage you. He knew that what they were enduring, they needed courage to face. And to assure you, like reassure, if you're wondering, if you're doubting, I just wanna assure you, Peter says, that what you are experiencing, and this is mind-boggling, is truly part of God's grace for you. So stand firm in this grace. (laughs) <laughs> what? What an un-American thing to say. Hardship is a problem. Hardship cannot be redeemed. Like, hardship should be avoided. We should move toward comfort. We should move toward preference. This is so countercultural. What Peter is not saying is that the hardship was caused by God. What Peter is saying is that the hardship and the way God meets you in it will form you and shape you. And God has laid a foundation when he says stand firm in his grace. What this literally means is stand in the grace that God already established for you. He knew, he saw, he'll carry you, he will make it worth it, he will meet you in the midst of it. Don't give up, that's what he's saying. And that's why he's saying courage to you, assurance to you, don't doubt, don't think for a moment that because it's difficult God has given up on you. He is with you and he, will sh- he is so strong. He doesn't need to just rescue you from hardship. He's so strong he can carry you through hardship and make it mean something and form you into the kind of person who can endure things you never thought you could endure because of his strength and his partnership in you. And so Peter says, listen, I know you're living in a place that does not feel like home. And I know it's hard in really tangible, challenging ways. But courage to you. An assurance to you, God has grace that he prearranged for you, an established foundation on which you'll be able to stand. And so flip back to the beginning of 1 Peter. I just want you to catch this, because when you read 1 Peter, what are you reading this week again? What did I say? 1 Peter, when you read 1 Peter this week, 
You just need to know this should land in every single day of our lives. When he writes at the beginning in 1 Peter chapter one, verses one and two, he says, I'm writing to God's chosen people. Somebody say chosen. chosen. Don't forget, you gotta hold on to that. God's chosen people who are living as foreigners. He says this, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago and his spirit has made you holy. What Peter does right out of the gate is say, I know you're experiencing hard things, but don't forget who you are. You are known, you are chosen, and you are being made holy. In a land where you may feel completely misunderstood, you are known. And in a place where everyone on different places for different reasons might reject you, you are chosen. You are not the last one left at the line for kickball at PE. You're not a leftover, you're not neglected, you have a name, you are seen, you are known, and he chooses us. Some get, people get all caught up in who God chooses and who doesn't. God chooses everyone who responds to him. He chose every single one of us and elected every single one of us to come alive in him. And when we cooperate with that, we experience that. Every single one of us finds our way into God's family and we say yes to his choosing us. He chose us and he knows us and it matters. And if we ever lose sight of that, we're gonna lift our feet and float along with the pool and it's not gonna go well. We are known, we are chosen, and just so you don't miss it, we are made holy. Holy does not mean holier than thou. Holy, especially for you who are maybe finding your way here for the first time and have all kinds of hesitations about followers of Jesus because you've met some and some of them are really arrogant and like trying to declare all the things that are true with a certainty that's just unreasonable. And they say clarity is kindness, but it sure doesn't sound kind. It's not presented with kindness. I just want you to know that's not what holy means. Holy means set apart for a different purpose. Don't miss the first two parts of that word, set apart. The difference between us and people who don't know Jesus should be clear and is no accident. Why would anyone who doesn't live with Jesus as king live like someone who believes he is? The difference is on purpose. It's a calling we live into. It's, we're coming, I talked to this guy at Starbucks who's just like, God is like helping him realize that selfishness is part of what makes life miserable. And so he's really working at being unoffendable and just not holding on to stuff. And he's saying, it is so freeing, it is so great. I just want people to know, like, you don't have to be ticked off. You don't have to be entitled. You don't have to worry about your rights in every single second. And I'm like, thank God for some freedom in this guy's life. And thanks for the reminder, because I lose track of that too. We're set apart for a purpose, for our joy, for God's glory, and to look different. The difference is on purpose. I just don't want us to forget that. For the next several weeks, we're gonna hold on to not just those words, but more and more where Peter reminds us who we are, remembering who we are. Sometimes where we're from starts to over-influence who we think that we are, but we need to remember who we are. Tell somebody, remember who you are. That's hard when everyone around you might feel different. Uh, the word foreigners uh, in, in the beginning of 1 Peter can be translated a number of ways. Uh, foreigners, aliens, exiles, uh, strangers, uh, but one of my favorite is, is sojourners, one who's traveling in a home that is not their own, one who is residing, living, dwelling, and seeking the good of a home that is not their own. But we're not sojourners looking back in, in nostalgia to try to get somewhere that was before. Believe me, I'm not looking back toward Illinois, okay? We made it out, that's where we're at at this point. <laughs> Love the people, great to be from there, but listen, not looking, we're not, and, and followers of Jesus, we're not look, sojourners looking back trying to get home. We are looking forward in hope of what God has already arranged and promised. Knowing that God has more ahead of us than we are currently experiencing now. And the way to live into that is to cooperate with him, not what's around us. A sojourner is a great image. In fact, there was one uh, who would take that name. Her, her name was Isabella Bomfrey. And Bomfrey was not her last name. Bomfrey was a Dutch word for tree. Her father was really, really tall, and so they gave this group of people the last name Bomfrey. And so uh, she actually ended up being quite tall as well. She'd be a mother of five who became an author, a traveling speaker, one of the only itinerant women to travel and speak across the country before the Civil War. 
She would eventually meet a president at the time. She stood on her own nearly six feet tall, but you just need to know her history and the history of our country stands far taller than six feet. She was bought and sold four times as a chattel slave before she escaped and her freedom was purchased for a mere $20 and her child's for five more. She sensed God's spirit as she would hear about the things of God. In fact, she heard it from her mother. Her mother really taught her primarily one thing according to her. Her mom would constantly say to her kids, there is a God and he sees you and he hears you. She said, this was the tenor of the message I received from my mother. She held on to that and later in life, you have to read her autobiography. Oh my goodness, it is so rich, just wow. But she encounters God in a powerful way and acknowledges that God has a calling on her life. And she would become a force for the abolition of slavery, the temperance movement, and for civil and women's rights in powerful ways. You might actually recognize her name, Sojourner Truth. Why would she take that name? Yeah, you can clap. She has a, an immense effect on our history. I couldn't help but when I saw this word, I couldn't help but think of her name. I had little more reference up to this point in my life than maybe a blurb in a history book multiple times over going through school, but you gotta look into her life. What a powerful, powerful life. I just tried to figure out why did she take the name Sojourner Truth if her name was Isabella? She'd always been known as Isabella. Why'd she take this? She said this, Sojourner, because I was to travel up and down the land showing people their sins and being a sign to them and truth because I was to declare the truth unto the people. She took on a new name because she received a new identity from a God who saw her, who heard her, who knew her, who loved her, who eventually rescued her and placed a calling on her life to seek better for those around her. She recognized that the land in which she lived was not her own, not only literally but spiritually, and she was going to do something about it. She lived as what you might call, you could translate Peter's words as resident aliens. Chosen foreigners, living differently, standing not just in opposition, not just working against the culture, but standing in Jesus' name for what is right and for what is better. Peter will say this when you get to it later in 1 Peter chapter two. He'll say this, you followers of Jesus are the chosen ones. Uh, wait, next, next slide, please. You are the chosen ones by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments. This is what she realized. God had a calling on her life to do something in his name. And if you point your life toward Jesus, the same is true for every single one of us. Chosen, tell somebody they're chosen. Well, you're chosen not just to be belonging with God, but to what it says next, to do his work, to speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference that he made for you, being the kind of people who went from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. This is what Peter says, and so he says this. Friends, and I just want you to hear this really personally right now. He says this to all of those who are following Jesus, who lived in a place that didn't feel like home to them. He says, friends, this world is not your home. This world is not your home. You are chosen, you are known, you do belong, just not here. This world is not your home. And so he says this, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. In the pool imagery, don't lift your feet. No, what he says is stand firm in the grace God has already arranged for you. This is what we're gonna try to, it's not, it's not easy, it's nuanced, it's hard to know how much, one degree or 180 degrees. Jesus, what do you want me to do? This is complicated, I wanna be loving, I wanna be like make space for people, but God, how do I honor you first and above everything? God, it seem, you seem to align with this, but I don't know how much, and all, it's challenging, but we just need to stand in the grace that God, not just standing with culture, certainly not lifting our feet and just floating along with what's around us. That's crazy talk, that's not in relationship to Jesus, that's just trying to be easy about things. Nor should we people who always just work against culture in some kind of combative, arrogant nature. That's still life just based on culture. And not even in our preferred blend of with and against, but in all of the places we find ourselves asking Jesus, what is the direction you call us? When do I need to stand firm? When do I need to move forward? When do I need to move with? God, how do we live in a place that's not our home? Or the way we've been saying is, that how do we live differently 
together. Uh, today, I just wanna offer you two very quick ways to do this and tell you how we're gonna do it for the next six or seven weeks. How do we embrace who Jesus says we are in a world that seldom cooperates? That's the question we're going after for the next seven weeks. How do we embrace who Jesus says we are in a world that seldom cooperates? Number one, we remember who we are. Tell somebody, remember who you are. I learned this from a friend when he was uh, parenting teenagers. He might still do it, and I heard a few other friends who, who do this as well. There's a moment, parents, when the teenager walks out the door and you're like, welp, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> You've done your best. You've handed values. You've offered correction. You've made expectations. But the truth is, especially once they put the keys in the car and drive off, you're like, we don't get to control what's next. Can I get an amen? Amen. So he would say something every single time his uh, child would leave the house. He would say, hey, remember who you are. Hey, don't forget who you are. Whatever you face, whatever choice you're about to make, whoever you find yourself with, whatever emerges that you weren't expecting, whatever mistake you didn't anticipate but ends up happening, don't forget who you are. This is what Peter is gonna say in every line of this letter that I hope you read this week. Follower of Jesus, remember who you are. You are chosen, you are known, and you are set apart. You belong. You've gone from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted, and the look on someone else's face when you show up doesn't change that. Their opinion of your status, your clothes, your demeanor, or anything else doesn't change that. If you can raise your self-worth, you could not be worth more in God's eyes. Remember who you are. We gotta remember who, if we're gonna stand in a culture that doesn't affirm all of who what Jesus says, clearly does not, we gotta remember who he says we are. Our identity comes from him. What he says goes, we gotta remember who we are. Tell somebody to remember who you are. That's what we're gonna focus on for several weekends as we go through 1 Peter on the weekends, but we can't just remember who we are because who we are dictates what we decide to do. So we gotta not only remember who we are, we gotta do what he says. So tell somebody, do what he says. Do what he says. Listen, when we put that healthy church football up, there's a reason there's a crown there, because Jesus is king and there is no other. He has good in mind for us. He's a benevolent king and he knows everything beginning to end. And so when he says to do something, even when we disagree, we do what he says. We put it into practice. It's how we live into the identity he's already arranged for us. This is why Peter in the last part of verse two says this, as a result of being chosen, known, and set apart, not to earn it, that's religion, that's not what we do. We don't earn anything, Jesus paid for everything. And so all of what we do is in response and cooperation with him because of what he's already done for us. And so as a result, you have obeyed him. Do what he says. And we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Even when we don't get it right all the way, he's already made a way for us to stay with him. We're already forgiven because we trust Jesus and what he did for us. And so we do what he says. The way we're gonna do that together is we're gonna look at the book of James through the week, uh, through each of the weeks for the next eight weeks. Tell somebody James. I love James. James is the half-brother of Jesus and he wrote the most like potent, pithy, wise, practical book in the New Testament. It's like the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's like cliff notes of Jesus. That's what it is and how to do it. And so in groups, I hope, in your family with someone alongside you, uh, we, we just put together a set of verses that you can look through. So I just wanna encourage you to grab your phone and scan this QR code. This is how we're gonna do it together. On the weekends, we're gonna remember who we are in First Peter, and during the week, we're gonna look at James and we're gonna do what he says. We're not just gonna learn what he says or talk about what he says. We're gonna be people who support one another in doing what he says. Tell somebody, do what he says. But we gotta know what he says so that we can do it. Not to earn anything, because we're already chosen, known, loved, and set apart. But we live into that by doing what he says. And so I just wanna encourage you. Some simple questions. If you've never read the Bible, you can do what you'll find at that QR code, I guarantee you. You can do it with a spouse, a roommate, a child. You can do it on a break at work if that's allowed. You can do it, in, you can do it at the gym before or after. I recommend before, look, whatever. Find some people and look into that together and say, how are you gonna obey this? Here's how I'm gonna obey it. I'm gonna check in on you. Let's do this together. Peter finishes by praying, may God give you more and more grace and peace. 
May God give you more and more grace. The, the people suffering the things they were suffering that he wrote to, they needed more. Does anybody need more and more grace? Does anybody need more and more peace? Listen, I'm just saying. Jesus says, trust who I say you are. and Trust what I say to do. Hold on to me and hold on to each other as you trust who I say you are and trust what I say to do. This is the kind of people that we wanna be. And so, the, so first Peter and James, this is where we're going for the next eight weeks and I hope you'll do every single week with us. Let's do this together, let's listen well and do what he says. One last thing to leave you with, I wanna invite you to pray together as a church. If this is your home and we are your people, I just wanna invite you into a prayer that people have already been praying that maybe we could just pray together. Sometimes I don't know what to say to God and other people's words help me along the way. So here's what I wanna offer you. In every season of our church, every six to eight month season, well before it starts, we gather a group of people and say, what is God doing among us right now? What are we celebrating? What questions are we asking? Where are we experiencing frustration? And then we send those groups of people to interview people across our whole church, four, five, six people each, and say, what is God doing? Where are we frustrated? What should we be celebrating? And they listen across our whole church because we wanna hear what God wants. We don't just wanna decide what we think is best. We wanna do our best to hear what God wants. The Bible calls that discernment. God, what do you have in mind? We want what you want, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And after they've listened to all those people, we take everybody's names off it and we put it on some pieces of paper and we look across it and say, God, what are you drawing across lots of people from all corners of our church that we should be listening to and hearing from? And as we do that, we just kind of distill it down into some themes and say, God, this is the best we know that you're saying for our church right now and we're gonna go after it. If you were to put part of that into two words, those words are different together or distinct community. This is what we're running after. And what I wanna offer you next is a simple, it's not the scripture in any way, shape, or form. It's definitely influenced by the scripture. It's our best description of what we're hearing God calling our church to. And I just wanna ask you to pray about it, invite people into it, ask God to make it true in ways we don't even understand yet. But this is what we said. We wanna be a people standing together, standing together in contrast to our surrounding culture. We wanna be known more for our common pursuit of love, our hope in Jesus, and our generosity to all than by what we're against. In a culture where people think Christians are just against everything and against them, that's not who we feel like we are or God has called us to be. We, we pursue love, we like absolutely hope in Jesus, and we wanna be generous to everyone. And so we wanna be a standing together in that. We wanna be a people who are holding counterculturally to the one, in case you're confused, it's Jesus, that's why the O is capitalized, holding to the one Jesus who we follow and to one another in unity. We've talked a ton about this. We wanna hold on to him and to one another. As the world around us reaches, in all, reaches and pulls us in all kinds of directions, Whatever way the water's flowing, we wanna hold on to Jesus and hold on to one another. Because we wanna be a communal invitation. A communal invitation to something bigger and more stable than what the rest of the world offers. We believe this is God's calling for all followers of Jesus and our church in particular in this season. And so if you resonate in any way, shape, or form, I'm gonna put it full screen so the whole thing's on one screen. If you wanna capture this, I encourage you to take a picture of it, consider it, and if you find it to be in line with what God calls us to be as Christians and you wanna be a part of this group of people, I just encourage you to hold on to that, to pray that for all of us. Call to mind the people you sit around, that you serve on a team with, the kids that you lead toward Jesus in kids ministry, uh, the people that you attend with, the people that you hope to bring along one day, that you would just hold all of us. God, help us stand together. God, help us hold to you and one another. God, make us a communal invitation. If those words are helpful to you, I just encourage you, we could pray those together. Listen, we wanna do two things, and we're gonna do them for the next eight weeks. We wanna remember who we are. Tell somebody, remember who you are. And we're gonna do what he says. Tell somebody to do what he says. We're not gonna do either one of those well without Jesus' help. So I wanna invite you to stand. And here's what we're gonna do. I want you to call to mind a corner of your life where it's hard to stand with Jesus. 
Culture is pushing and pulling hard against you. And I just wanna encourage you to offer that to God right now and ask for his help and his support and consider asking a human around you to stand with you in the midst of that. And as we do that in just a moment, we're gonna sing a simple song saying, God, we need your help. Would you meet us in all of this? And we'll finish our time by celebrating communion. So this week, uh, let's make a habit of remembering who we are. One of the best ways to do that, read through the book of 1 Peter, a short letter that helps us so much. And let's be people who do what he says. Let's gather some people, look at the book of James, download the study if that's helpful to you along the way, and let's live in Jesus' direction together. If we can support you in any way, we would love to. Head over to canyonridge.org where you'll find everything you need to know along with the way to get in touch with us. If this was helpful to you, I encourage you to share it with a friend and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you soon.